following announcement has been paid for by the WZWA Network. Hi, everybody. This is former WWE superstar Al Snow. And PWN is Sean Oliver. My name is Eugene. And you are watching the Insider's Edge podcast. Now get on the train. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Insider's Edge podcast here on the WZWA Network in conjunction with Blue Wire Hustle. I'm your host with the most on the West Coast, California in Fury. So great to be with you this morning. I'm aware that I look like a bag of shit right now, but uh, as you all know, usually we do interviews later at night, but you know, we, we had an opportunity here today to talk to somebody who has been uh, a massive bucket list guy. And uh, first and foremost, I better introduce my co-host here today. It's been a while, Jack. How are you going, my friend? Yeah, uh, it's been such a long time. Um, it's funny. Last time I did show my face on the Insider's Edge podcast, I said I was busy with a full-time job and everything like that. Well, not anymore. So you might see this face on the uh, on the channel a lot more now. So uh, <laughs> no, nah, not bad, man. Not bad. It's good to be back here. Excellent, bro. And, you know, uh, when we first started this show, I think it was like May last year or something like that. I think when I said to you, you know, let's list off some guys that you, you know, for the bucket list, who, who would you want? And I'm pretty sure within the first few minutes, Jack, one of the first names that came out of your mouth was one and only sick Nick Mondo. And all this time later, we've finally been able to get one of your childhood heroes here on the show. So without any further ado, ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor and Jack's honor to introduce here today on the Insider's Edge, the one and only infamous legendary sick Nick Mondo. How are you going, my friend? Doing good. Thank you guys for taking the time to chat here. I'm looking forward. Happy to be here. Awesome, man. It's going to be a lot of fun. Absolutely. And uh, first and foremost, right out of the gates, I uh, wanted to ask you uh, your thoughts on the recent uh, Game Changer Wrestling show that you were able to be at. Oh, man, my thoughts. Well, that was uh, lots of thoughts. That was an incredible weekend. Um, it was, they. I think there were three or four shows. Um, and I was out there for the Deathmatch Hall of Fame, um, but I did hang around, watch some matches, and um, actually came out during Tournament of Survival to introduce the trophy for the finals. Um, but overall, I, you know, what just really struck me is it was the first time in over a year that I felt like, wow, this is like post-COVID, um, which I know we're not completely out of the woods yet, but like I showed up with a mask on, took it off and I didn't put it on till like three and a half days later. And, uh, you know, I'm vaccinated of course. Um, but early on I had told Brett, the promoter, like, <clears throat> you know, if I do this, like people are going to want to be taking pictures, arm around the shoulder and stuff like that. And I said, I'm a little concerned because like, um, I've been working on productions here in Atlanta and we have to, uh, mask up and we get tested like every day. Um, so if you test positive, like you're gone. Um, but again, I'm vaccinated. And um, so I, I when I said that to Brett, he said, well, we're in a pandemic. If you don't want to do that, don't worry at all. That's just the way it is. And, uh, but I was comfortable with the situation and everybody, the energy was just so positive, man. It was just so exciting. You know, it just felt like we're back. Um, so I, I had a blast. Yeah, it must have been a thrill for sure. Uh, after all this time, I guess people kind of forget how, uh, you know, amazing just the regular life, you know, that you live is. And just being being able to go to a wrestling show and have there be a full crowd is uh, certainly something that's thrilling after all this time. Uh, let's let's get to this uh, Deathmatch Hall of Fame induction alongside Supreme's daughter and Jean over the weekend. Um what did it mean to you to be inducted into this uh, hall of fame and, 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 and be bestowed on this with this honor? It really meant a lot to me. And, um, you know, it was sandwiched between, uh, two shows, this, this, uh, deathmatch hall of fame event. And I was kind of wondering, like, is this just going to be an obligation that, you know, people go to like, okay, I guess we need to sit here and listen to this, but, I'll say like, it was a really good time. They kept it entertaining. Um, 
There was a beautiful intro for um, Supreme, of course, uh, Sage Sin Supreme accepted on his behalf. Um, and then Eugene, who built a bunch of deathmatch wrestling contraptions, uh, Cage of Death, and he's just like an architect of all that stuff. He was there and a bunch of wrestlers came up on stage to honor him and made it really entertaining and funny. And it was just a great time. Um, I, if uh, people don't know, I carried a title when I was wrestling and I, I still had the title when I retired, the Iron Man title. And Brett Lauderdale got that thing for me. Uh, I could grab it if you want to see it. Hell yeah, man. Sure. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Yeah, let me go get it. <laughs> oh man, it's be fucking awesome. <laughs> Absolutely, man. I love when guys bring the belts on the show. Yeah, I can't stop playing with my toy. <laughs> oh, oh man, that's awesome, so, dude. Awesome. That's incredible stuff, man. It's actually it's actually got a few uh it's got some wear and tear and somebody changed the logos on it and stuff like that. So I'm going to doctor it up and redo some of the lettering actually in metal. I can print in metal and redo some of the paint and the CZW logos and stuff, but it's got a ton of signatures on it. We've wow. got Kevin, we've got Kevin Steen. We've got um, Wife Beater, Adam Flash, um, a ton of a ton of people on here who held this belt. Lou Fisto, and uh, yeah, Nick Burke, and and all sorts of people. So um, yeah, Sammy Callahan, and so yeah, <laughs> it's pretty sweet. This was a gift they gave me, and boy, it means a lot to me. <laughs> oh man, uh, it, it would have to mean so much to you. I mean, I know that wasn't your first CZW championship, um, but that you know that was one that I believe you held the most in CZW um, on then, it, yourself. Yeah, just this, the sacrifices for that thing too. I, I said during my speech, I might have knocked off a year or two of my life. I mean, just like I said, I can point to my back and show you the scars from when I won that thing um, that night, and it's so. Yeah, I, I put a lot of pride and hard work into that, and it's it's really exciting to have it again rightfully so man it's awesome yeah, it's great bro it's been a while since you'd you know come out there in front of uh, your audience and uh i wanted to know how it felt hearing uh cut my life into pieces uh you know uh, last resort by papa roach one more time before walking through the curtain at gcw tournament of survival 666 brett asked me last minute if i would do that and said sure why not? And uh, it was pretty funny because I can remember fans, you know, singing that song, but it was like the whole place in unison just sang it when the lyrics hit. And um, so that was, that was really a trip. And like I say, just, I think the fact that this is the first, you know, GCW show really back after COVID just made everybody appreciate everything so much more. So man, what an experience. I just talked to Johnny Cashmere, who was uh, present, and he said, that was one of the best weekends I ever remember having. And he said, I, I still have an adrenaline buzz from just the, the reconnecting with everybody and the experience and a live show again. So it was, it was great. That's yeah, great, bro. Um, I wanted to, okay, take it from the present and bring it all the way to the beginning at this point um, before I throw it over to Jack with his round of questions. Uh, First question we usually ask on the show is, how did you become a wrestling fan when you were a young man? I wasn't a wrestling fan as a kid, unlike most people, uh, until ECW came around. And so I was about maybe 15. Friend bought, brought me to a show and, whoa, okay. So this is, this is different. Um, it's a little more intense, a lot more intense. Um, and I was hooked. Um, I was living on the East Coast, United States. So I got to see a lot of shows. We'd see house shows, small venues. There was one that only held a little more than 200 people. And I saw Rey Mysterio Jr., Chris Jericho, Cactus Jack, Sabu, uh, Steve Austin, all sorts of people wrestle there in front of about 200 people. It was really something. And then, of course, the ECW Arena, that which energy that people just talk about is legendary. But... I will say, um, just jumping ahead real quick, I've experienced that energy again at GCW shows. I didn't think I ever would, but um, a couple of years ago, I attended a show in Los Angeles and I said, they've recreated that same vibe. Um, they had a mix, they brought in Masato Tanaka and they had some comedy and they had some high flying stuff and you know, the Jungle Boy and, um, and Jimmy, Jimmy Lloyd and you know Nick Gage and Jimmy Havoc and, um, 
Alex Zane. And I mean, it was, it was, uh, they recreated that, but, but yeah, e ECW is what, what got me into wrestling. I can totally uh, see how mind blowing something like that would have been back in the day, especially during that time period. And it's really awesome to know that you actually were able to be there at that stage of ECW when guys like Ray and Hoovy and, and Steve Austin uh, were, were on the show. Um, and, you know, from that point, uh, I guess you, you, you've been bit by the, the wrestling bug as a lot of people uh as, as a lot of people deal with uh, when they become a fan. At some point, though, you want to get into the business. How do you uh, go about finding a school? You end up training with Al Snow. Um, how, do, how do you get into the wrestling business? I was eager to get into it. Um, as soon as I graduated high school, I went to work for a concrete company because it was the most money I could make the fastest working 12, 13 hour days and making money. And I worked for, I don't know, five, six months saved up. And uh, I wanted to make it quick. So I researched schools. Um, Al Snow's school was, uh, I think six hours to the west of me. I was in Pennsylvania and he was in Cleveland, Ohio. And, um, but his training was six hours a day, six days a week. So you lived at the school and um, it was intense. Uh, it was painful, it was brutal, um, but I, I wanted to, let's figure this out and let's get to work. I didn't wanna be, you know, some protege for like a year, a year and a half, which is probably better in most situations. But like, I was just a determined, motivated kid. Like, we're gonna make this happen and I'm, I'm gonna get out there and wrestle. So that's how I did it. Awesome, man. Awesome, bro. Um, and I, I just wanted to also just go back to what you said about GCW because over the weekend, um, that this is the first GCW shows I've caught and been able to like just sort of watch. Um, and I, I'm completely agreeing with you. I'm not a big guy on, you know, a lot of independent promotions these days. GCW, on the other hand, does have something different to it and something that could almost be compared to the original ECW um, with what you just said. And I remember I said, I said this to someone the other day. So um, thank you for sort of reiterating that point. Um so when you were doing uh, sort of training um, with Al Snow, of course, was deathmatch wrestling ever something that had ever crossed your mind when you were training, uh, something you were going to get involved in? You know, it's funny, like, I had seen matches from Japan, I, you know, thumbtack matches, uh, stuff like that. But the term hardcore was really popular at the time. I um, mean, extreme, extreme was really popular. There were extreme sports. That was a big deal. You know, the skateboarding, picking up speed and getting a little bit more respect and stuff like that. So in my mind, I wasn't going to become a deathmatch wrestler. Like we had, we had heard of King of the Death Matches in Japan in 1995, but like, it just sounded like a special event or something like that. It wasn't like, I'm a deathmatch wrestler, you know, it, the concept wasn't necessarily in my mind, but I was really inspired by the athleticism mixed with some really hard hitting um, and violent uh, stuff in ECW. But my intention was never to take it as far as we did. Um, it was just the ECW style, which I still think is the pinnacle in my mind of the right amount of wrestling and violence mixed. Um, I did an interview recently where we're picking like three, you know, if you could only pick three matches to watch on a deserted island, which I don't know why you'd be watching wrestling if you were stuck on an island. But, but I, one of them I said was, uh, you know, pick anything from Masato Tanaka and Mike Awesome. Oh, yeah. And I said, if, I, if I had to pick one, maybe I'd say um, just the, the one night stand. Or, or was that what it was called when they came back with the, That's it. the WWE promotion? But they might have had better matches, but the, the passion, because everybody missed it so much. Um, that was as in my mind as good as anything they had done and, and to me that's kind of like the pinnacle of the style of wrestling that I like um, you know I'm not so much just like hungry for pure bloodshed but like I like a good combination you know yeah definitely man um, so you, you make your CZW debut on uh, May the 6th 2000 against Trent Acid I uh, just got a couple of questions in regards to this one so how did you actually uh, sort of get picked up on CZW's radar um, of course looking back at your career, man, you're, you're a gem. So that would have been a massive get for CZW at the time. Um, so how did they discover you? 
you know, how did you get in touch with CZW? I spotted, um, I was going to say, um, actually, Johnny Cashmere was there for my Hall of Fame induction. And I think the video is uploaded. Maybe if you guys want to put it in the link or something. Hmm. Um, but I was going to say, I, I answered this question um, in my Hall of Fame speech this past weekend because I saw Johnny and um, I was on an indie show, like maybe it was a, a PCW Pennsylvania Championship Wrestling, I think it might have been. But I was planning a spot where I was going to get launched out of the ring. And the ring was on a, a roller skating uh, rink, so a hardwood floor. And I was going to take a flip bump and just splat on the floor. And uh, um, I did that bump. But uh, but when Johnny Cashmere heard me calling that, he's like, I think there's somebody you need to talk to. And um, <laughs> he mentioned me to John Zandig. And John's like, all right, show me his stuff. And and so I sent in some of my matches. And John said, yeah, we'll give him a tryout match. So So that was it. Awesome, man. And of course, nobody would have uh, ever seen coming how uh, crazy stuff did uh, go on to be. But um, over this time, you know, you ended up having so many memorable matches, um, you know, a handicapped three-way ladder match teaming up with um, the legendary Super Crazy. I mean, you being an ECW guy, that would have been an, an insane experience for yourself. Um, you know, you had the violent six-man tag team match with Zandig and Wife Beater um, against the Backseat Boys and Justice Payne. Um, and of course, an infamous no rope bar wire match in a thunderstorm with Nick Gage. Uh, that would have also been a very interesting experience. Um, it's clear at this point, uh, you were already building a cult following within CZW and even having kids uh, dress up as you in the crowd, like Rory. Um, how did this sit with you, given um, that you were sort of intending on always having a bit of a shorter career? I'm not sure if from the start you knew you were going to have a shorter career, but um, did you know when you were in CZW that you had to make the most of it? My plan was only to wrestle for one to two years, if you can believe it. Wow. I, and I didn't know how the wrestling business worked. And in my mind... I'd finish school, I'd go bang on the door at ECW and I'd be in there with, you know, Tommy Dreamer and Sabu and Rob Van Dam. And like, I'm like, that's where I'm going. I'm going to go work for ECW. And uh, <laughs> so, but no, that's not quite how it works. Um, and so I ended up working closer to five years. So it was longer than I expected, but um, that's why I was burning the candle at both ends, so to speak, because I, my intentions were not to have a long and prosperous career, but to just hit it hard and wild and chaotic and get out. So definitely, man. And I, I'm 23 now, so I could not imagine how, you know, having a hall of fame worthy wrestling career, especially at my age. So, you know, at 23, what were the emotions you had when you had to walk away from the ring? I mean, I know that was probably, you know, a sigh of relief per se. Oh man. So many emotions. See, see, I knew, I knew I was done. Um, my plan was to retire after a tournament of death too, but I think that might've been in the, in July. And I don't think I officially announced my retirement until November of that year. And I had already decided that that's going to be my final performance, but it was just, Oh, I was so pulled back and forth in my head and it would everything I ever wanted from wrestling was offered to me at the end and after I quit and it kept coming back to me and I never got to wrestle Sabu, but he was one of my all time favorites. Uh, and Sabu and Hayabusa were my number two, were number one and two influences. And I had three offers to wrestle Sabu um, after, right after I retired and people told me he wants to wrestle you. And uh, I was even offered a no, no ropes barbed wire match against him in my hometown in Minneapolis. And like, I had already made up my mind and I was actually crying because of that one. I, I, it was, so it was very hard. I was offered very good money. I was offered chances to go back to Japan. Um, TNA was trying to get me. It was, uh, it was so tough. Um, so, <laughs> you know, it, the wrestling is an addiction and it's, it's not easy to quit. And um, yeah, I mean, even to this day, I, I sometimes things tempt me. So. Yeah, I can only imagine, man. Uh, back to you, Carl. Uh, yeah, I mean, you, you mentioned John Zandig before, and, you know, we haven't had the chance to have anyone really speak about him on the show before. So I just wanted to know uh, what was it like working with John, and do you have any particular stories that, you know, highlight what he's like as a person? Yes. Tough guy, kind of quiet, kind of kept to himself. You got to earn his respect. The only way you earn his respect is if you're willing to hurt yourself, you know? Yeah. So he, 
loved me, but it was like, because I, I, I won't say no to anything. And, you know, that was the reason, you know, but we had some real top talent come through CZW. I mean, you search YouTube, you'll find CM Punk, you'll find uh, Kevin, Kevin Owens, Kevin Steen talking about like Xander kind of giving them, all, giving them a hard time. It's just like, who are you, you know, prove yourself to me. And so, um, but I'll say this, you know, the dude created a wild product that was really exciting for fans. And um, I mean, they, you legit had to protect yourself at shows because there's just glass flying everywhere and chaos. And um, so it was really exciting, but it's just, there was a high cost as well. Um, you know, my, like I say, my plan was to have a short career, but had I been under wiser leadership, maybe I would have stuck around longer. If there was somebody, instead of just like giving me everything, every sharp object to play with, um, instead saying, no, we're gonna do a slow build and we're gonna get the most out of this. Instead, it was just like, okay, who's gonna die on the show tonight, you know? And um, <laughs> so, yeah, that's about what, all I can say. I'm, I'm grateful. He gave me a stage, he created a quite an atmosphere. And um, so, you know, I'm grateful, but it's just like, there were consequences as well. There was a price to pay, you know? Okay. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, another obviously infamous moment and, and something that you've mentioned is one of the most painful things you went through in the wrestling business was a, a weed whacker spot with wife beat at the first uh, CCW tournament of death. Tell us a little bit about that. What some people don't know is um, I'm not the first to take that, to take a really bad one to the stomach. I was touring Japan um, a couple years prior and uh, Yamakawa, um, I don't know if you guys remember him, but he would wear white pants and like a white cowboy hat and he'd kind of do a break dance spinneroony type deal. Japanese guy, really charismatic, um, is missing his front teeth. Um, but I saw a wife beater hit him in the stomach in Japan with that thing and it was a bad one. I mean, like, oh, it got him so bad. And that haunted me. And that was just a small house show because we were touring going all over Japan. I don't know if he intended it for it to be like that, you know, because he's Japanese. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you. Afterwards, you know, just <laughs> say thanks and move on. But boy, they had to wrap him up and bandage him up and he took some time for him to heal. But um, I was like, cause I didn't see a lot of things that I was afraid of and that, that haunted me. And then it was kind of like, I have to do this, which is not a good mindset, mind you. <laughs> if there are any deathmatch guys listening to this, there are much smarter ways to get over. I'm as hypocritical as anybody, but um, I understand the mindset. And so I decided to eventually do that. That was when I picked to do it. Wife Beater and John actually tried to talk me out of it. So completely wow. my, my fault. Um, but I knew that there was going to be press there. I knew there were some wrestling journalists there in magazines and it got coverage and it went everywhere. And, you know, so all the things I've done in my career, that's one of the things that gets talked about the most. So, <laughs> Sorry, <Brutal. laughs> Absolutely. And another thing that gets talked about quite a lot, Tournament Death 2, working three death matches in one day, it sounds like you might need a little bit of uh, bed rest after something like this, but uh, you, you should have been dead after the semifinals and then you go on to win the whole tournament. Uh, can you tell us about that day? Because it's uh, certainly one of uh, the in most infamous days in your career. It was rough. I, uh, I broke my wrist in three places a week prior. Um, and it was one of those cases where Right after it happened, I told John Zandig, I just broke my wrist. And uh, um, and I went back and I got an x-ray and sure enough, it was broken in three places. And But I could tell it, the question was just like, don't tell me you're gonna pull out a tournament of death. And and I didn't, um, but th that was just the mindset, you know? Um, but uh, so it was rough. Uh, first round match, JC Bailey, we worked really hard, light tubes and ladders match and uh, um second round yeah went off the roof with john that was terrible um he called me a week in advance asked me if i would do that spot i told him yes 
I showed up and I told him, John, I think that's a little bit too high. He pressured me into doing that. Um, and so I did. I didn't think he was going to pressure me into doing it, but it was too late to go up there and adjust the tables properly because the fans were already in. And so what happens is the ring crew thinks they're protecting you and they push, they tend to put the tables in closer than they need to be. Mm. Uh, but normally you'll go up and, you know, I'll tell them, move it out, move it out there. That's the spot. Um, because you step and you fall forward, you know? And so, yeah, they were too close. We couldn't hit them properly. I overshot my head caught some of the tables, but I went straight to the asphalt two stories down and knocked out completely, completely out black. Um, woke up, was paralyzed um, for a minute. Those tables were gonna be burning. That was the original plan. And so I had a stinger, meaning I was knocked out and I was temporarily paralyzed. Somebody would have had to pull me out of the fire if we had uh, done that as planned. Um, so yeah, it was, I was a mess, um, but I knew that I was going to um, retire after this. And so it turned out, I, I think I cut an artery in my, back I don't know it, it was bleeding so terribly um and one of the nurses pulled out a shard of glass and it was spraying it spraying blood on her um I turned around it was on her arms and her shirt they were panicking they couldn't get it to stop and they said we're calling an ambulance um and I said wrap me up like I'm, I'm gonna finish this thing and uh I was so concussed um give credit to Ian Rotten he completely carried me through that final match which is a terrible match but I I couldn't even put two thoughts together. I was a, I was a mess. Um, but that's the reason I finished that night. Cause I just wanted to be done. So yeah. That's fucking crazy, dude. That is crazy. <laughs> Over to it's you, Jack. A, it's a shame that you didn't have any, you know, like much of a recollection of that night. Cause I mean, that just would have been special to sort of, uh, if you were able to just remember everything and then be able to put on, you know, the, um, the show of your life for the last match. So, I mean, it sucks, but I, I mean, that roof spot, I mean, you, you're going to take that at home for life as well. So, <laughs> I mean, it goes both ways, but I, I've, I've also been thinking for years, like what the hell did your parents think about all this, all about all the death match stuff? Were they ever supportive? They were pretty concerned. Um, I, I had a very good household growing up. Um, and so I hid it from them as much as I possibly could. I didn't tell them anything about it. And, my mom was always watching me like a hawk. I'd, I'd show up at her house and she's like one time I, I broke my nose and I had two black eyes. And so um, <laughs> I put, put my teeth uh, almost all the way through my lip and I had to get stitches. And so I delayed visiting her two weeks until I thought my face looked good enough. And it, as soon as I walked through the door, she's like, what happened to you? And starts crying because I had two faint black eyes still. And um, so I tried to, I tried to keep it from them as much as I could, you know? Yeah. Um, being a character in uh, backyard wrestling too, uh, as well as essentially a staple uh, in all other wrestling games that aren't WWE licensed these days, uh, were you a big um, video game guy growing up as well? Sort of a segue. I'd say I was a big video game guy until I got my driver's license when I was 17 and then things changed and I just had more options. Um, but I, I love video games up until that point And, I still, you know, it's funny because some people are like, I play two games too much, but I'm like pleased when I make time to play games. And so I've got a switch and like, I was happy because during the pandemic, I, I played and finished Breath of the Wild and I love oh, that man. game. And so good. I'm, I'm really enjoying uh, Doom 2016 on the switch and I got Doom Eternal and I'm going to give that a shot when I'm finished with this one. And so. Um, so yeah, but there's a, actually, I'm in a, I'm in a new game that's, um, coming out. It's called the wrestling code and, uh, they've been sending me models of my character for approval back and forth and, and that thing's coming together. Um, so that's, that's going to be on all the major systems and excited for that. That game looks awesome, man. Um, like I've seen some screenshots of it as well that have been posted online that they, they look better than WWE 2K. Like those models look better than 2K and, um, it's, it's exciting, man. It's exciting. Um, but getting back to some wrestling, um, you returned in 2013 to save uh, Rory Mondo at Cage of Death 15, sort of saving Rory Mondo from himself. Um, of course, you have mentioned today already that, that you have had urges to, you know, go back, maybe have one more match, take a couple more bumps. But how was it for that moment when you were actually, you know, in the ring or on top of the Cage of Death? Um, was there any urges to, you know, just take bumps and um, pretty much get amongst the match? Uh, do you have any stories from that day? 
Well, you know, when I showed up, they, uh, they were just like anything you want to do. Um, <laughs> but I did, DJ did say I have to do something in the match because um, Necro Butcher um, got himself into some trouble and was removed from the main event and the show. And so I was essentially filling in for him. Um, but I, I did the bare minimum. I said, okay, well, if you want me to help a team win or whatever, I'll do that. Um, but I didn't come here to wrestle tonight. Um, but yeah, to be honest with you, like I was watching them set up some of the gimmicks and the multi-tier scaffolds with glass. And I'm like, oh, I start getting ideas. And that's <laughs> just how my mind works. Like I, I it's a thrill, especially if like I, I know I can survive it and pull it off safely. Man, that's a rush. Um, so so yeah, I was getting those urges, but like the reason I came back was Rory told me this is going to be my final match as little Mondo. I'm going to have them hit me in the stomach three times with the weed whacker. And, um, and I didn't like the idea. You know, I, I remember when he was 10 years old and like 90 pounds and, you know, I, it, it, it upset me and I'm like, please don't do this. And he's like, Nope. I'm doing it. And, uh, <clears throat> and I figured just fine, dumb kid, but it bothered me. And then finally, I mean, like two weeks before the show, less than two weeks, I was in Japan living there, but I messaged him. And I was like, if I make an appearance in your match, will you not do the weed whacker? And he's just like, yeah, cool. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, all right, I'm coming out. <laughs> really? I'm like, well, yeah, if, if that's what you'll agree to. And, and I thought I kind of owe it to him to show up once. And if it's his last match, like, let's, let's do it. You know? So that was, that was it. Um, so, yeah. I thought, I thought it was awesome and really symbolic, man. Um, Cause you know, everyone's seen the picture of you and Rory from what, like 2002, 2003 or 2001, uh, very young man, both of you look very young. And then to sort of see, you know, a picture of you guys, what 10, 11, 12 years later, um, you know, in the cage of death. Um, I think that's, you know, they're, the, they're the sort of moments that make wrestling really special and i don't care if you know it's a if it's deathmatch wrestling or you know old school wrestling like anything like that like it still makes wrestling wrestling and i think those those moments are really special so i'd rather see that than you know rory Mondo take a weed whacker three times to the stomach um but we we do know that you have no desire to wrestle ever again um and i'm and you've already have pretty much just said here that you would probably never wrestle again um but has the spike in your gut to perform like at that level? Um, that's obviously very well past it. Is there any sort of indication that you would ever return to wrestling sort of, you know, maybe as a uh, broadcaster or manager, anything like that? I'm sure there's a lot of Nick Mondo fans out there that aren't done with Nick Mondo on TV. I don't want to be in the ring unless it's a hundred percent. And if, if, if I can't uh, match the level that I was at before or surpass it, I don't want to do anything. Um, yeah. I'm doing stunt work currently on a TV show. Well, we wrapped season one. It's called Heels and it's a pro wrestling action drama. Um, it's coming to stars uh, August 15th stars, Stephen Amell. He's had a match with Christopher Daniels um, in the beginning days of AEW and did a tag match in WWE. Um, but, but yeah, it's two brothers running an indie fed in Georgia. And um, so when I got the gig um, through the stunt team, um, I submitted my look, my ring look, and they approved it. They said, yeah, you can do that on the show. And so, um, so I, I appear on the show. I don't have any lines, um, but I'm a wrestler who lives in that world. And I do a couple of stunts um, on the show. So that's a trip. Um, and they hint at the end. Well, actually, no, I better not say that. Uh, <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just say this. Um, some of the things coming up in season two, I really hope I can um, be a part of, but I, I don't know what the plans are. Um, and I guess we'll have to see if they do get a season two, but, uh, um, but it's, it's pretty exciting to, to put the gear on, to not get murdered, you know, and uh, <laughs> make some good money. so it's, it's a blast. Yeah. Awesome. Man. Uh, it's great to hear. I'm really excited to uh, check that out when it comes out. Um, Wanted to uh, move into talking about your experience living in Japan, uh, working in the film industry. Obviously, this is a big part of your life. Uh, please tell us a bit about that. It was a lifelong dream. Well, not lifelong dream, but um, I toured Japan when I was 20 years old. And I, I 
was just so blown away, so blown away and never got that out of my mind. Um, so it was a long-term goal to live and work there in film. Um, pretty much anybody can get a job there teaching English. Um, and if you're an English native, English speaking uh, native speaker. And um, I had applied for that job and I got it. Um, and I actually interviewed in Canada. But I met so many people who say Japan's great, but you need to find another way to be there. And um, so it's very controlled uh, oftentimes, like the lessons and I, people just don't tend to really, if you, if you, your passion is teaching, it's, it's a good idea. If it's not, it's probably not a good idea. Um, so I turned down the job actually. Um, but in 2011, a big earthquake and tsunami hit Japan and there was mm -hmm. a nuclear power plant meltdown, the great triple disaster. Um, and that led to a job I got working as a documentary filmmaker um, up in the disaster zone, very suddenly, like I've been studying the language, but I sure wasn't like ready. And I just got tossed in the deep end and it's just like, wow, I guess we're doing this. And um, that job lasted a year and I ended up staying about five years in Japan, um, continued to work in film and a little bit of acting, some stunts um, and production. So yeah, I loved it. Um, still a, a longer term goal of mine to maybe have a residence in Tokyo and one in the US split my time. So, so he was uh, just going to ask then, uh, well, so coming back to North America and um, working with John Moxley on vignettes, uh, how was that experience for you sort of coming back uh, to the US? Um, was there a sort of a culture shock per se, um, given you were in Japan for five years? The first time I came back to the US after I was living in Japan, was bizarre because I visited some places that I was familiar with and I kid you not, it literally felt like everything doubled in size. It, it was so surreal, like just the streets, how wide they were, um, distances between places. We don't realize just how much space we have here. Japan is the size of California, um, yeah. but it has one third of our population. Um, and so, Tokyo is very, very um, condensed, very, very packed full of people. So, but I made the trip back and forth a bunch of times. And so by the time I came back, I wouldn't say it was culture shock. Um, it was refreshing though. Um, I love Japan. I, I adore Japan, but I don't think I ever want to be there like full time again. I'd like to be able to bounce back and forth because there are things I love here and there are things I love there, you know? Yeah, man, for sure. For sure. Um, so obviously, uh, you became a AW director um, in December of last year. So how did all that come about? I'm assuming this obviously has a direct correlation with um, your work with uh, John. And obviously you guys would have had the relationship already from um, CZW back in the day. Um, how had everything um, with you and AEW come about? And um, how did you start building that relationship? Well, yeah, as, as people know, John's contract expired with WWE. And prior to that, he had hired me to make a promo video um, to drop as soon as his contract expired. And so we did that. Um, that thing really made the rounds um, in the wrestling world. And so he hired me for a couple more. And um, yeah, from there, it was just kind of a natural progression. He went to AEW and um, then I ended up working for them. And what a, man, what an incredible trip that was. Um, I worked for them right up until the pandemic um, from the start of their TV show up until the um, pandemic. And so, like I say, it was like the, the honeymoon period, man, it just so much optimism and um, seeing the responses, you know, in every single city that we would go to. So um, that was a trip. That was, that was absolutely <laughs> incredible. Yeah. <laughs> so um Matt, we, we, you became, ended up obviously becoming the AEW director in December of last year. So what are your duties as a director of, at AEW consist of? And how may a usual day uh, sort of look like? Holy cow. Yeah, I kind of got tossed in the deep end. Um, I, was, I was living in Los Angeles and I flew to Atlanta to check out the team that I would be working with. And it was just to see if we vibed, you know, like a three-day trip, uh, um, visit and just chat with people. But I, I came in and I was sitting in the offices and I saw that they were working on an interview with uh, Riho, um, but they don't speak Japanese and I, and I do and I can edit um, Japanese. And so 
I need to keep a dictionary, you know, with me. Like I, like I, you know, I'm not like perfectly fluent, but I can edit in Japanese. And so I said, Hey, do you want me to take that on? Cause they had a much longer process of getting somebody to put subtitles on the raw footage and then chop it down from there. And, and they said, yeah, sure. And I realized there are so many fires to put out. Um, there's so many, you know, projects going on that I just, they could use all the help they could get. Um, and then I was supposed to um, go back to LA and because um, we decided, yeah, it's, it's a good fit, pack up my stuff and then move to Atlanta. Um, but one of my team members happened to be flying back to shoot stuff with uh, the Young Bucks. And, um, and then Brandy had an idea for a, a commercial. And it was just one guy going there to do all this stuff. And I'm like, you could kind of use some help. And, and so like in the midst of packing my stuff up, I'm running around corralling people and, and shooting stuff for the bucks. And with um, Scorpio, um, he uh, was in a commercial that we shot. And so uh, it happened very quickly. So it was so new and it was so fresh that like, the, it's true that AEW doesn't hire writers. Um, they've, they've got the executives, they've got um, the Bucks and they've got Kenny and Cody and uh, Tony and those, that's who makes the decisions. You know, that's, that's kind of how it is, but they don't have writers working for them. And so oftentimes um, we can just pitch stuff or work with wrestlers. Here's the slot that you need to fill. We need a 90 second promo. Um, and so a lot of creative energy it was a lot of just the wild west, you know, um, getting together with guys and, Hey, we want to make a, a nature show that Dustin Rhodes and I kind of, um, worked together on an idea with uh, Jurassic express and, um, had them out kind of foraging in the wild and, you know, um, Lucha Soros ripping leaves off the of trees and eating them and jungle boys drinking river water and stuff. It was pretty funny, <laughs> but like, it was just all stuff we came up with on the fly and, hired a David Attenborough type narrator. Um, and it's just, <laughs> just a lot of fun. I, I can remember Marco Stunt saying like, this is my favorite part of wrestling, um, making videos. And, and Darby Allen said the same thing. Um, the, the guy's got a lot of passion in the ring, but a lot of these guys just love getting together and making short movies is what it is. It's a blast, you know? And so I had a ton of fun doing that. Yeah, it's awesome, man. You, you could tell, like, people like Darby love it. I mean, you, you look at the, his cameos that he does for people, man. Like, essentially, like, you know, short little two-minute films for these people. I mean, and everyone else would normally just sit in a camera, hey, this is so-and-so, and happy birthday. Whereas Darby Allen, will, he will go 120% for his cameos. And I mean, it just, yeah, that just makes a lot of sense there to, um, that they'd love it. Uh, so back to you, Carl. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, now that my internet's uh, not... Uh... <laughs> letting me down uh, I want to ask a little bit about um, another documentary that was made a while ago uh, called Unscarred the life of Nick Mondo um, and a bit of a random question but you know all the things that you've done in your wrestling career a lot of adrenaline will take place but I can't think of anything more that would would bring out adrenaline than throwing water bombs out of a car at people uh <laughs> The beginning of this documentary, I'm in stitches over some of the pranks and some of the, the fun stuff uh, that you got up to back then. Do you have any uh, fun stories of uh, pranks and, and such that you uh, would do back in the day? Did you know I had to pay a pretty steep price for doing that? The the water balloons out the car? No. <laughs> no. Yeah. Oh, man. This, this, of course, was my idea. Um, which, oh, let me... I was going to say... <laughs> I'll get back to that, but I just thought of something. I have a history of ideas that get people in trouble. Um, but I was going to say, we were coming back from an AEW show. I, I was just telling this the other day, and we were in the Atlanta airport, and um, Darby Allen likes to travel with his skateboard. And uh, so we got to this long corridor, and it was full of people. And I was like, Darby, I bet you're not brave enough to skate the whole length of that thing as fast as you can. <laughs> <laughs> he's totally like putting the board down and looking around and, and I was like Darby 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 like listen I have a long history of daring people to do things and they end up getting in big trouble and then he was <laughs> like and I have a long history of taking dares and getting in trouble and I'm like good let's just not do this thing 
But anyway, back in my teen years, I, I came up with the idea, like, we, we were organized. We had two cars, and there's, like, a driver and a thrower, and then a driver and a, a filmer, you know, just to make sure we get the best shot. And uh, so we had, like, a whole laundry basket full of water balloons. And But we were just having a blast driving around, hitting everybody in town. And, like, <laughs> by the time we got back, I mean, there were, like, six reports to the police. They're, like, no denying it. You know, like, we weren't <laughs> even thinking license plates and everything. And so, <laughs> of course. Oh yeah, so we got busted, and um, I think it was just a fine, and we had to do community service. Um, but but it, it was one of a couple of things that went on my permanent record because I was 19, and I'm just like, yeah, maybe we should stop with this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, the, 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 I guess you had to pay a price there, but um, you know what we got out of it was some uh, hilarious scenes there in that uh, documentary. Uh, <laughs> uh, speaking of documentaries, uh, moving forward to the trade, um, I want to know about your effort in making it stand out from other wrestling documentaries. Um, this must be a pretty special uh, piece that you put together for this. Yeah. You know, I'll, I'll never make another film like it. It was, one where I just opened up my psyche and whatever came out, came out. Um, I had an outline for how it was going to come together, but it was very much just like a, just dumping out everything that was inside of me, you know? And so it was just a, a trippy sort of a cerebral look at my career and psychological struggles and, and the difficulty of leaving it all behind and something I'm, I've struggled with, which is um, guilt for, influencing younger generation to really walk in some dangerous footsteps because as we discussed earlier my plan wasn't to have a long career and so I didn't that's something that's concerned me like I didn't lay a blueprint for a long wrestling career and, but most guys that get into it that's what they're thinking this is what I want to do with my life and so um, you know I've come to terms with it now it's like I think when we want to do something we find somebody who's doing it and we already make our decision. It's just like, where's an example of what we want to do. So I don't think like people see me and decide that's what they want to do. I think it's already in them and then they see it. Cause like, it's like, put it this way. Um, I knew I wanted to get into some really risky wrestling. Like I, I knew it after watching ECW. Um, but I didn't see Sabu at first. He was away for whatever reason. Um, and I was just looking for a blueprint. And then I see him and I'm like, yeah, that's the style I want to do. Um, but the decision was already made up in my mind. You know what I'm saying? So. Yeah. Awesome, bro. Uh, Jack, we'll throw it to you to those last couple of questions. Yeah, I got a um, last couple more from here. And um, then we'll get into our final segment with Five Second Friends. And then we'll look to uh, put a bow on this. Um, so I did really want to know about the uh, challenges between shooting in Japan and shooting in America. Um, I'm not too sure if there are many, you know, differences or any rules you got to follow. Uh, but being a media uh, student myself in uh, high school, as well as um, going on to do TAFE, um, I find this to be insanely interesting. Um, so what, did you have any challenges between shooting in Japan and shooting in America? You'll find a lot of red tape in Japan. Um, if you haven't been there, I really hope you can visit because it's such a different feel everything is ordered everything is predictable um nobody answers their cell phones on the train you'll never hear a ringtone go off on a train like the, they just silently text and um yeah, nobody's talking on the train um but it really has a an adverse effect on art in my opinion there's so many rules you have to get through and it's 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 difficult to get things moving in Japan and it's just simply because of the rules so if you want the it's I've never felt safer anywhere I mean I'm not the kind of guy that you know walk around New York City at night and feels like I'm at risk because I'm probably not the kind of person somebody's going to jump but everybody just keeps to themselves in Japan and respects your private space even in the most uh, dangerous sections of Tokyo. Um, I, Kabuki Cho in Shinjuku is my favorite place to hang out or one of them. That whole part of town is run by the Yakuza, um, by the Japanese mafia and uh, they keep it safe. Um, the Japanese mafia pays taxes over there on their 
illegal dealings and the police appreciate this because they can track them you know they have businesses they have offices um so what i'm saying is like everything is predictable and everything has a rule book and everything is controlled and everything is safe and that's how they want it there uh it's beautiful for living but it's it's challenging to get uh film work done there you, you can figure it out but you have to earn people's trust you have to sit down have coffee with them slowly earn their trust and, and it's kind of the process yeah yeah man depends on my bucket list to visit for sure i mean um, i don't like to- I haven't left the country in 20 years, but um, hey, maybe maybe Japan can be uh, the first place I visit uh, leaving the country when all this madness is over. Um, I just wanted to also just give you the opportunity before we move on to Five Second Frenzy, if you have any uh, sort of media in the pipeline that you would like to um, plug. I know you did, did mention the um, other show before that you were working on, um, but was there anything uh, else that you were working on that you'd like to plug? My big push right now, it almost happened last year, um, is a thriller film with John Moxley. Mm, okay. The title is American Blood. We've been working on this for about two years now. Um, we had a deal to shoot it last year, but COVID messed that up. And so I'm trying to get that back on track. I just had a meeting earlier today. And so I'm fighting for that. My Instagram is Nick Mondo Media, if you want to um, you know, keep an eye, but I'll, I'll definitely be putting updates there if anything happens. So I'm trying. Awesome, man. Good stuff. Over to you, Carl. Awesome. Five second frenzy. Awesome. Yeah, no, that sounds exciting. But uh, something else that's exciting here uh, is our segment, Five Second Frenzy. It's about 10 to 12 quick fire questions, uh, just about things that you like in life, mate. Um, it's, uh, you know, even if you don't get the answer in five seconds, it's okay. You won't get in trouble. But uh, the first question is Who is your favorite wrestler? Current or all time? All time. Hayabusa. Nice. Over the years in wrestling, who was your favorite opponent? The Messiah. Nice. Uh, What would you say, looking back, is the favorite match you ever had? Probably versus Messiah in California for Epic Pro. Excellent. Uh, getting away from wrestling now, finally. Uh, favorite book? Neuromancer by William Gibson. Wonderful. Uh, the next one, favorite TV show? All time. All time. Boy, that's tough. Yeah. <laughs> Usually gets tough around this part. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if I can answer that one all time. Um, let's come back to that one. I can't. Uh, yeah, because you know what? Like, there's so many shows they go astray a little bit. So yeah, I don't know if I can. I don't. I don't know if I want to just like pin one. So, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I get you. Uh, the next one might make it even more difficult. What is your favorite film? If I have to pick, I'd say Alien, 1979. Nice. Uh, nice. Favorite musical artist. If I have to pick. I'd say The Cure or Joy Division. Nice. Very nice. Very nice. Uh, Favorite food? Probably just really good spaghetti. I make really good spaghetti. (laughs) Excellent. Uh, Favorite place to eat on the road? Chipotle. Nice. We've had that answer before. Uh, I'm not sure if you're much of a drinker, but uh, what would be your favorite alcoholic beverage? kind of cheap but uh well if not a nice bourbon um i drink captain morgan i like captain morgan nice (laughs) excellent excellent uh the second last one here matt your favorite female body part (laughs) (laughs) um this is creepy i have a thing for really cute noses I think it's the first time we've had that answer on the show. Very nice. I'm just uh, I'm trying to be polite here, but I do have a weird thing for really cute noses. So there you go. <laughs> there's nothing wrong with that, my friend. Uh, and the final one for Five Second Frenzy. What is your favorite curse word? Mm. I'm trying to think of something creative here. <laughs> favorite curse word. Yeah, I don't think I have a favorite curse word. 
professor that <laughs> <laughs> no worries mate well we really want to thank you matt burns aka sick nick mondo for being on the show with us here today this is huge for my co-host here jack so um we're really happy to have had the time to speak to you and uh we just want to say that um you know, we hope that you're so proud with everything that you've accomplished in your wrestling career and also after wrestling. And I think it's really important that I mentioned how far people can reach in this world. And with, with Perth, Western Australia being where we're from, the most isolated city in the world, um, for you to reach this far and for my co-host Jack growing up, for you to be one of, you know, his idols, I think that's an important thing to 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 say and and, and to speak of how far you have reached. So, ladies and gentlemen, that was our interview with the one and only sick Nick Mondo, aka Matt Burns. What a great guy, a talented guy, and just a fantastic interview. So, from myself and my co host Jack Wallace, we want to thank you guys for watching the Insiders Edge podcast here on the WZWA network in conjunction with Blue Wire Hustle. And we will see you next time. Thank you.